Welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast, where we explore the spirituality of the Christian child through the method of the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I'm your host, Carrie Mecki Lozano. So for the last few summers of the podcast, we have kind of showcased a book to encourage you to use as a summer book study with a group of friends or fellow catechists or parents or at just anyone at your church. And so for this summer, we are going to encourage you to do a book study using the book Ways to Nurture the Relationship with God. This is a really amazing book. It's one of my favorites. It is a partnership with Sophia Cavaletti and Patricia Coulter. And there are four chapters in this book. We have already done two of the chapters in previous episodes of the podcast. We did uh, the chapter that is on the birth and infancy of Jesus with Anne Garrido around the time of Christmas. And we did a chapter on the roots of the Eucharist and the Easter mystery around Easter last year. So for the next three episodes, we are going to be finishing up this book. So today I have Dan Teller, who has joined me on the podcast to dive into chapter two of Ways to Nurture the Relationship with God, which is on the parable of the Good Shepherd in the Gospel according to John. And then our next episode, I have the co-author of this book, Patricia Coulter, who joins me for two episodes, one to talk about her time in Italy and living with Sophia and Jana and what that was like and also how this book came to be. And then the following episode, she will be concluding our book study, talking with me about chapter four, the final chapter on the parable of the true vine and the gospel according to John. So I'm really excited about going on this journey with you guys. We will be creating some study guide questions to help you on this journey. So talk to your friends and fellow parishioners and see who would like to do this book study with you. I have done a book study with this book multiple times, and it is definitely worth it. I hope you enjoy. Well, Dan, welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child Podcast. I'm really excited that you're joining me today. Thanks, Carrie. I'm really glad to be here as well. Would you tell us a little bit about who you are and your involvement in both Montessori and CGS? Yes, I was a Montessori teacher. Um, I was trained in the early 1980s, and I became I worked at a public school here in Cincinnati, set up a pre-primary classroom, and while there, entered more deeply into my faith life, desired to work in a Catholic environment, and got a job as the principal of a parochial school here in Cincinnati. And at that time, realized that I needed to be in a Montessori setting because it was superior to what I was in charge of. Decided to figure out, well, how can I do that and also be in a Catholic setting? And the answer was to create a Catholic Montessori school. And then I had to decide, well, how do I add a Catholic component to a Montessori program? And that's when I discovered Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. So I um, started working on this idea to create a school And um, through a lot of work and a lot of people's efforts, it came to fruition. And I became, started my formation in CGS in 1998, the summer before the school began. I had to stay ahead of the children. So since our school was starting with uh, preschoolers and kindergartners, but growing one grade level per year, I had to quickly do all three levels of training to stay ahead of the children. So in five years, I did levels one, two, and three formation and started working as a catechist um, as well as a teacher and the head of school at this young, you know, beginnings program. So your school now, what are the ages that it goes to? It serves children ages 3 through 12, uh, 3 through 14. It's called the Good Shepherd Catholic Montessori. It's here in Cincinnati. It's I'm no longer there. I retired from there a, a year ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I led the school for over 20 years. Wow. But um, I do go and volunteer there in the atrium and was there today and enjoyed seeing all the children. So it's still part of my life. And you're a formation leader as well, correct? I am. I've been leading courses at level one, two, and most recently at level three. Um, I've had the pleasure to work with Donna Turner and mm. Kathy Yohani, and that has been a really rich experience. So I'm enjoying all that work. Well, thank you. Thank you for all of that service. That's so I, I love hearing about Catholic Montessori schools and what how they have come to be and how they have merged this beautiful relationship between the Montessori work and our faith, which is 
seems so perfect with what Maria Montessori had in her vision for the whole child as well. So. It's good because it also avoids a lot of the challenges that many catechists face in implementing their beloved CGS work with children, whether it's space or time. And in a Montessori school, we can just provide everything we need to have a really ideal atrium environment and session groups of children. So it's really a gift to be in that setting. So how often do the kids in the school go to the atrium? They go once a week for two hours. That's awesome. What a gift. Yes, it is. I would love, I have like this dream of a day in my life where I will have more time <laughs> when I can, for the group of kids that I have come right now, I'm in level one. So when they come to me in level one, I wish they could come to the atrium like twice a week or for more time or maybe all year round because it just never seems to be enough time, you know, to be in the atrium and to, it's so like this time of year, especially as we're coming towards the end of the year, you really see the kids sink into this, the spirituality and the retreat like setting that is the atrium. And um, it's so hard to part with them for the whole summer. I know that it'll be hard to bring it back to that at the beginning of the year. So it's neat that you get to have a solid two hours with your kids in the school. It's That's very special. And it's so nice to see them respond to that with well, that's all they know. They yeah. think this is what this is, and they're very relaxed. Um, and there's a lot of time. There's no pressure to, you know, get through things. You know, you're going to have time to work with the children as needed. Yeah, yeah. Such a respectful environment. So, who were who were your formation leaders? Like, who was your level one formation leader? My level formation level one was Betty Hisong. Aww. Betty was. My beloved gateway into the world of CGS. I went and visited her Montessori school when researching how to create our school. And she took me under her wing and gave me a tour and then happily came down to Cincinnati that summer to offer a formation course that summer and the following summer. How lucky are you? You got Betty to be your formation leader. That's awesome. Yeah, I really... She has a beloved place in my heart. Yeah, yeah. And then for level two, I traveled to Cleveland, and uh, Linda Kale and Rebecca Reutsevich mm. were led a course. That was really a lovely gift, of course. Mm -hmm. And for level three, I went to Chicago for um, Rebecca was a formation leader, and Judy Schmidt and Tina Lillig. That's awesome. May they rest in peace. Man, you have quite the all-star formation leaders that formed yeah. you. That's awesome. It is. <laughs> Well, I'm really excited about our conversation today. We were just talking about this, but this is one of my favorite CGS USA books is Ways to Nurture the Relationship with God. And I'm really excited. I'm always excited to talk about this book. I'm always excited to get the opportunity to sit with one of the chapters. So you and I sat with chapter two, which is on the Good Shepherd, which is such a perfect parable to sit with during this time of Easter. Um, so I'm excited to get to talk to you about it. But Sophia begins this chapter with talking about parables. So let's first start there. Like why, what does Sophia say about parables and the parable method? When I think about that question, I think about something Betty said regularly in my level one course. And that is, we come here not to necessarily learn a lot about God, but to come to know God. Mm -hmm. And God is a mystery. And I think Sophia is always pointing at us back to our relationship with God is relationship with mystery. Mm -hmm. And mystery is always an invitation to go deeper and never get to the end, because of course we won't fully understand this ever. And so she wisely gives us this method that Jesus himself used in helping us approach the mysteries of the kingdom, the mysteries of himself, the mystery of how to live well in the kingdom, and that's these beautiful stories of parables to enter into relationship, one that is rich and never ending. So for me, that's how I would think about the answer to that question of why parables. Yeah. Yeah. And parables do such a great job, like what you're saying about mystery of helping us be okay with not getting to the end of, of just sitting with and pondering with and not necessarily needing to come to a conclusion and parables kind of help that because um, I mean, it is easy with parables to extinguish that and say, this is what it means. But when treating it as Jesus treated it, as it's, as it's meant to be treated, it's just kind of sitting 
and enjoying the mystery, not necessarily needing to solve it. No. St. Augustine said, if you think you've understood, what you have understood is not God. Mm. Mm. Amen. Yeah. I love what Sophia, the imagery that Sophia uses about the railroad tracks in regards mm-hmm. to this, she says on page 35, imagination does not mean fantasy or something unreal, but rather a process that involves penetrating the reality suggested by an image. The elements of the parable, the everyday and the metaphysical, are like two rails upon which the imagination moves in order to reach the meaning of the parable. They help our mind from wandering or fantasizing and serve as tracks to guide the work of probing to the depths of the truth. The image acts as a sort of station alongside the track, signaling the new reality that stands ahead. This is the task that the imagination needs to do. I I love that imagery of the railroad tracks that the parable offers of helping us kind of go deeper into the mystery, like giving us the track to go deeper into the mystery and not necessarily, um, yeah, like we were saying, solving it. I like thinking about that image too as well, Carrie, especially sometimes with older children and the level two or three atrium. I don't know if you've encountered this, maybe others have, but sometimes a child will say, well, what if this, Mm. what if this is in the story? And they'll start to create their own elements to the parable. And I think about the one track, which is, this is the, this is the narrative Jesus has given us. So let's stay on that track and help that track point towards the transcendent, the mysterious realities that he's inviting us to explore. But we can't leave the one track of the parable itself Mm -hmm. by creating a new parable that we want to think about. I'm not sure if Sophia meant by the track, but that's how I experience it. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think that is what she meant by the track. And it's interesting with parables because it's almost like, what's the right way to say it? Like, I don't want to say therapy, but I can't think of a better way to explain it. Like you can almost see people processing things in their personal life. And the, granted, this is the older child through the adult that I'm talking about now, not the youngest children. The youngest child sit totally with the heart of the parable and they are fine there. As you get older, like for instance, today, this morning, I met with a dear friend's little daughter who I'm helping prepare for her first reconciliation in Eucharist. And so we were on the parable of the found coin, the found sheep. And so we were talking about being found and she brought in how her cousin was lost and um, her aunt was frantic looking for the cousin. And then when they found him, she was really upset. And so she was almost like she was processing. The parable stimulated a processing of her own personal encounter with something, but it wasn't fully on track on the rails that got like what you were saying of God's narrative it she was able to draw it in her personal experience but bringing them back to the main parable as the main story i agree is very important because the mother's reaction isn't necessarily the same way that the good shepherd's reaction would have been you know um it was a very human reaction so it was interesting to have that conversation with her And I've seen that with adults, too, with parables that, um, especially with the prodigal son parable, (laughs) that their own personal wounds come out within parables. It's very interesting. I know this isn't the ultimate focus of this conversation, but it reminds me of, I was reading the final chapter of RPC1, Anthropological Catechesis. Yeah. And Sophia's talking about the difference there between rooting a catechesis on particular human experiences versus rooting catechesis in human nature. And so you're just mentioning all these different individual experiences that people can come and go with and start to leak as a starting point to an exploration of faith Mm -hmm. and aspects of faith. But the image of just the idea of human nature itself and the need to be known, the need not to be lost, the need to be protected, mm-hmm. that underlies all those experiences. And if we, the parable goes to that fundamental aspect of humanity. Yeah. And that's, you know, we, we can be sure that that's a good track for us yeah. and not get way, way laid on these individual human experiences so much. Of course, it's important to talk about with people if they're going to bring them up. I don't mean that we should ignore them. But it's not the starting point. Right. I agree. I agree. We, Especially as we get older and we have more 
baggage and more wounds and more experiences, it's easy for us to divert from that track of those main things that Jesus is trying to say in these parables, like the parable of the Good Shepherd of, you know, I am here, I protect you, I um, lay down my life for you, these essential things. It's easy for us to divert from those tracks, but... I think that's why I like this imagery of the track so much, because it does. It pulls us back to, well, okay, wait, but what is Jesus really trying to say with the prodigal son? He's trying, he's talking about mercy, you know, um, which we can divert from very easily, especially as we get older. Okay, we could talk about just parables for a long time, but let's move on to the Good Shepherd parables specifically. So what I appreciate about what Sophia and Patricia did in this book is offered us the depths of the Old Testament that help bring this parable into deeper layers. Of course, these are not layers that we bring up necessarily with the children. This is more for us at our adult ponderment. But um, for the Good Shepherd parable specifically, she talks about Psalm 23 and Ezekiel 34. So I wanted to kind of go through those with you and just kind of what spoke to you and I about each of those things that help really bring light to the Good Shepherd parable. So for you, Dan, what aspects of the Psalm 23 that Sophia talked about really stood out to you? When I first started looking at it, I just looked at it almost in a Lexio sort of a way. And sometimes we can't express the experience that we have with the Word of God. I just looked at the first line, the Lord is my shepherd. And I just thought, I could spend 20 minutes just thinking, Mm -hmm. contemplating that. You know, the the contemplative images there, he leads me in right paths. Just to sit with that is a really comforting thing. So not any kind of discursive thought or conversation about it internally, just to sit with it. That's the first thing that struck me, how beautiful the images are just to contemplate. Mm -hmm. In preparing for this conversation with you, I went and met with a priest at my parish, Father Alabaiti. He's a Dominican. He's fluent in Hebrew. He's fluent in Semitic languages. I'm so sure Sophia would have loved him. <laughs> and he, he's like an elder. And I said, Father Alabaiti, I'm going to have to talk about these Old, Old Testament you know, roots of the Good Shepherd parable. What do you think? And the first thing that he said was really something that Sophia articulates beautifully. He said, the role of a shepherd in the Old Testament is twofold. It is to provide food, and it is pr- pr- to protect. And when you put those things together, it means it's to give life and to protect life. And I think Sophia lifts up that image in the book as she talks about the psalm as well. Um, interestingly, he told me that the Hebrew roots for the word shepherd is in the word Hebrew ra'ah, which means to care for. Hmm. The Hebrew for shepherd, I hope I'm pronouncing it properly, is ro'i. Ra'ah, care for, ro'i, shepherd. So it's nice to think about this is the role of the shepherd to care for it. And he said that not only is this the role of a shepherd, it's the role of a king to provide life and protect life and to care for the well-being of the subjects. And it's also the role of a parent. So we can apply all these things to different protective, abundant, life-giving roles in life. And then, of course, the sheep have a role, too, in a relationship. And that's the covenant aspect that Sophia will always lift up. The sheep's role is to be loyal, you know, to be close to and obedient to and listening to these good protective calls from the shepherd, whether it's the parent or the shepherd itself or the king. Those are some thoughts that I have about it. Yeah. I love I love the covenantal relationship that Sophia lifts up in this that that's initiated by God. The Good Shepherd calls us by name, and then our response to that call of to follow Him. I love that she lifts that up in all of her texts. She writes about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the other thing that I'm starting to find in a lot of the content for our work in the atrium, as we all, you already mentioned, this content isn't only for children; it's also for us as adults. Is that the question of evil and darkness? is not ignored and it's right there in the pair in the in the psalm mm-hmm. you know even though i walk through the dark valley i fear no evil for you are with me mm-hmm. so and we're going to encounter this in the good shepherd parable as well we're going to encounter darkness mm-hmm. and danger and evil with the wolf coming mm-hmm. so it's good to i don't know just realize that that's part of the psalm as well right, right. i love the way 
that um, she dissects both of these, Psalm 23 and Ezekiel 34. It's almost like giving a more thorough definition to the word shepherd, especially for our ears, our, our Christian ears, because we weren't taught to read the Bible the way the people who listened to the Good Shepherd parable 2,000 years ago, when they heard it, they immediately thought of Psalm 23 in Ezekiel 34. Like they immediately made those connections and were like having to be pointed out. Sophie's like, "Uh, look at this and finally paying attention to that. So it, it gives a deeper definition of what shepherd, specifically a good shepherd, the shepherd who is good, what that means. And so when we look at Psalm 23 and she's dissecting it line by line, it's explaining in God's terms what is a good shepherd. I love also what she talked about with waters. I think we kind of take this for granted because we don't live in the desert. At least, you know, anybody outside of Arizona doesn't live in the desert. Um, Mm -hmm. In America, at least. But when she talks, she says the waters are especially rare and precious in arid lands of Israel. So for the shepherd to procure water for his sheep is something very great for the Jewish listeners. She's referring to verse two and three, when he leads us by still waters. I never thought of that before, you know, like he's not only providing for them, but he's providing them something really rare and essential for life, but not easy to come by, you know, like he's, nothing is impossible for him. I, that just really stood out to me this time reading it. Mm Mm-hmm. Sort of along with that also, I'm thinking about the second part of the psalm. Sophia mentions in her book that the psalm has two parts. The one is pastoral, and the second part is festive, like we're at a table celebrating. And in the second part, the well-known line, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Just the whole idea of anointing Mm. and being chosen and being blessed with overflowingness. Mm -hmm. You know, that certainly is a beautiful precursor to what Jesus is going to teach in the parable. Mm-hmm. It really speaks to that abundance also. Again, you know, like he's just, it's not, he's, an, he's anointing us, the the oil, but then my cup overflows. It's not even just, I, my needs are being met. They're overflowing. Mm-hmm. It's so beautiful. You know, it's, it's interesting, Carrie, also for me that to recognize that we know that when we do the nativity work, and we go bring the shepherds in, we know that we're talking about a lower rung of society that had the privilege of receiving the announcement for the first time from these celestial messengers. And so at this time of Christ, that these shepherds are marginal. They're, as the priest Father Alabadi said to me, he told me they're kind of like cowboys <laughs> or, or hippies. You know, they're not, they're not well thought of by other people. Yet the, it, the, the role that they have, the work that they do spiritually is so, the work that they do is so expressive of our relationship with the Lord. Even this, this lower rung of society that it gives this image in this reality of a, a beautiful work that's being done. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of a juxtaposition there of the, the great and the small as we, as we know about in our atrium. Right. Right. And of course, we could do a whole episode on that juxtaposition alone that God has everywhere throughout, especially that has to do with Jesus. But he certainly likes the marginal and the small. Mm -hmm. But as we move into Ezekiel 34, we see that shepherd kind of has a different connotation than what you're speaking about of um, the king, where kings and the and the priestly men were the ones referred to as the shepherds. That's what people thought of whenever they saw, whenever they heard sheep, especially in the Bible. I mean, I'm sorry, when they heard shepherd, when they, in the Bible, they were thinking of the shepherd that was supposed to lead them, like you said, provide for them and um, keep them safe. And that was supposed to be the priests and the kings at that time. And Ezekiel lets us know that the priests were really falling short. And the priests, of course, were ministering largely in the temple and they were you know, committing the sin of their lack of care and their selfishness and their pride through their temple duties. And Jesus then comes and preaches about the good shepherd in the temple, as if he's saying, you know, this is the place where we need to switch all this or reverse all this and bring it back to its proper order. Right, which gives such a beautiful definition to the word good that Jesus emphasized. Mm -hmm. You know, he was in Ezekiel 34, they really lift up 
the bad shepherds, the shepherds who were not doing what they were called to do. They were not providing for their sheep. They were taking all of the food and um, not keeping them safe the way the shepherd was called to do. And so Jesus is calling himself the good shepherd or in, in the proper order would be the shepherd that is good. The shepherd that is good. So I am a, I'm a shepherd, but I am a different shepherd than what you are used to. I will actually provide for you. I will actually keep you safe because I am the shepherd that is good. And he also says how he's going to gather us, even the sheep that are not with him mm. yet. And of course, at the time of Ezekiel's prophecy, all the sheep are scattered. Yeah. They're in exile. He's writing during the Babylonian exile. So the sheep aren't even on their own pastures. They're in a foreign land. And Jesus comes and says, you know, I'm the one to, to bring them all close to me. You know, I'm going to bring them to this good place. I'm going to lead them out. Mm-hmm. So it's he's reversing all the bad things that have happened under these poor leaders at the time of Ezekiel. Right. Right. So bad that they lost their own land. They lost and almost lost their identity by having to go to another place. Right. Somewhere in the chapter, Sophia talks about that voice of the that those last few verses that you're talking about of the Good Shepherd parable and um, the sheep that do not belong to my sheepfold, they will hear my voice and we will be one flock and one shepherd. And I, I'd have to sit here for a second and find it in the chapter, but she says something about how it's talking about how the listening is different now because it's not listening always with your ears. This is a deeper listening that the voice of the Good Shepherd can penetrate even distance. And so any sheep that is anywhere anywhere on the world, you know, like they can also hear the voice of the good shepherd. And he is also calling them because he desires this unity. He desires this communion amongst his, his people, amongst his sheepfold, all to be together. That's that theme of the cosmos that we hear so often in the level two and three atrium. It's, it's universal. It's cosmic. Nothing is excluded from this call, this invitation. I love the children's reaction to that. I, I don't know what your experience is, but whenever I do the Good Shepherd parable with the level two or level three child and you talk about how far the voice reaches, you know, is it outside of our town, our state, our country, the whole world? It's so easy. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Of course they hear it. You know, like they have no question that people of other religions and cultures and other parts of the world, they also can hear the voice of the Good Shepherd. They just, Mm -hmm. of course. Of course. Yeah, immediately. The whole world. But I think as adults, if we really ponder that, do we really fully believe that what Jesus is saying, that all cultures can hear his voice, that all religions can hear his voice, that all places around the world can hear his voice all across time and across space? It's, that's a big thing to ponder if you really think about it. Mm-hmm. And also the mystery of what it will be like at the Parousia when all will be united with him. Today it's so disparate, yeah. you know, we see such a lack of unity. Yeah. But we're let it, we're let lead headed for this time of complete cosmic unity. So it's really mysterious. And so beautiful. Like and so not complicated. I think we sometimes complicate that so much of as if there's certain criteria for Jesus as sheepfold. And he's like, he he wants unity more than he wants that disunity that's caused by the criteria that we as humans create. Yeah. It's easy with the children to get underneath all these divisions. Yeah. Adults seem to fixate on them yeah. more. What I also found really interesting that Sophia lifts up in this chapter is when she speaks about the reaction of those who listen to Jesus speak about this parable. And I've heard this also in regards to um, John chapter 6, the, the Bread of Life discourse. When you pay attention to the reaction of the people to Jesus's words, you can get the depth of what he's saying. So like Sophia is lifting up about this parable that they hear what he's saying. And as Jewish people, they hear the connection of what Jesus is saying. He, they hear Psalm 23, they hear Ezekiel 34. So they hear, and because it's the feast of the dedication and they just heard all of those scriptures that have to do with shepherds on the feast of the dedication. Um, it's very fresh in their mind. So they, when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and they say to him, if you are the Messiah, tell us plainly in verse 24. They, they're they like, are you saying that you're the Messiah? Like, are you saying that? Like, this is a huge thing that you are saying. And 
you can understand, you can see almost the seriousness and the grandeur of what Jesus is saying in this parable by looking at the reaction of the people who were there and heard it. I love that she lifts that up. For me personally, that was one of the aha moments of my formation work when I was being formed in CGS with Betty, when she explained to us that this probably had been expressed at the Feast of the Dedication, this um, prophecy from Ezekiel, and that that's the moment when Jesus chooses to preach the parable Mm -hmm. and to say in not explicit, but pretty clear terms, I'm fulfilling it. It was a very great aha, beautiful, like, wow moment, like, oh, that's what you're Mm -hmm. saying. But it's good to remember that, you know, Jesus also is, he also is somewhat guarded when he gets these questions about, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? And the people there were looking for a Messiah, as we know, that was not the kind of Messiah that Jesus was going to be. They were looking for a Messiah that was going to free them from the Romans, that was going to be a liberator. And it put Jesus in a hard position, I believe. Of course, I can't speak for him, of course, in any way. But for him to say uh, directly, yes, I'm this Messiah, he he wouldn't want to be misunderstood. It's like, I'm the one that you're expecting, because he wasn't. So, you know, he didn't want to, well, again, I shouldn't, I couldn't presume at all. But my understanding is that them saying, are you the Messiah, was asking about you're a certain kind of Messiah that we're looking for and expecting. And the answer to that is, I'm not that type of Messiah. I am a different kind of liberator, one far beyond what you can even conceive of at this time. Yet I am that Mm -hmm. one. So, you know, Sophia talks about the the gravity and magnitude of what he was revealing about himself and how he had to go about it carefully because it was so much for others to take in. And I think you can see that in his response to these uh, direct questions from his listeners. Like, you're like a demon. You're out of your mind. Mm -hmm. Are you the Christ? Tell us plainly. And then he goes right back to the shepherd imagery that he's just given. Like, well, you're not the sheep that are listening to my voice. And so, you know, sometimes I want him to be more direct. (laughs) But Well, it it goes back to the parable method, right? Like, so he Mm -hmm. himself isn't, this is, I I feel like this is almost not correct in the way I'm saying it, but I don't know how to say it better. But he himself is a parable. So like it's he himself is to be sat and pondered about, you know, like he's not going to outright say who he is because he's a mystery that we can't possibly understand. You know, so he was inviting all of those people who listen to him to sit with this idea that he is a good shepherd. And so what does that mean? Well, let's sit with that, you know, and they were like, wait, tell us plainly, are you the Messiah? And he was like, well, I am the good shepherd. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, like he's like, that's that should be enough for you because your minds can't possibly understand who I am. So all that essential essentiality of what you need to know about me is that I am the good shepherd. That's all you need. Sit with that. And he's willing for uh, to leave us and the listener uh, puzzled. Mm. You know, we don't need to get all the answers right away. You, we just need to just just listen to them. Yeah, and again, that's something that us as adults are really hard, really difficult for us. But the children are totally fine with. This might be a tangent, but this is the Easter season, and I was just uh, reflecting on the road to Emmaus with a group of level three children this week, and we were wondering, it's like, why did Jesus walk with those men and not reveal himself? Mm. Why did he wait until that moment in Emmaus with the bread at the table? And then when they realized it, why did he vanish immediately? Mm. And one of the children, a girl, Ellery, said, he just wanted us to leave us with that image of himself in the bread and let us just kind of ponder his presence spiritually and not just face to face. So it's, to me, that's very much like a parable. Yeah. It's like, just keep pondering who you are and let us spend time with it and not worry about getting all the answers right. Yeah. It just takes so much time. It, it takes a lot of um, relinquishing control which again, us as adults have a hard time with. We have to Mm -hmm. relinquish the control of understanding, of um, fully contemplating what all of this is. And if you look at salvation history, you can almost see, you can see God making himself smaller and smaller. It's like he's like, 
hiding himself more and more. You know, we have God, the creator, and we have God through the prophets, which, you know, we still can see today. And then we have Jesus, who is God. Christ died and Christ is risen. But then he gives himself to us in the bread. You know, he's he's constantly making himself smaller. And in some ways, it's like he's making himself more and more parable, more and more a mystery, more and more something that we can't tangibly hold on to, that we have to sit and just be okay with not understanding, be okay with the mystery of who he is. So he's he's making himself smaller so that one thing that happens is that it forces us to be how we have to be okay with the mystery because that's all he's offering us is his mystery. Mm -hmm. Along those lines, it makes me think of at this time of year in the Easter season, he made himself unrecognizable. Yeah, yeah. He wasn't recognizable by the disciples on the road to Emmaus. He wasn't recognizable by Mary Magdalene at the tomb. He was only recognized in the first case in the breaking of the bread. And in the second case, by calling her name. Mm. So mm. it's just very mysterious, you know, the, the methods he's using to make himself known at those times to them and to us as well. Like, it reminds me of you saying he's making himself smaller and smaller. God is sort of hiding himself, you might say. I've never made the connection that Mary Magdalene recognized him when he called her name. You know, that just like the Good Shepherd he calls us by yeah. name. It's amazing how much that theme of knowing a name and calling by name um, appears in the Bible, but also in life and the importance of that, like knowing someone's name and calling someone by name and how deeply known that is. And, and Sophia speaks about that word too. I think as you move into the Good Shepherd parable, um, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. She talks about that original word and how it's similar to the one they talk about with Mary. And it's like, I do not know a man. So this is a very deep knowing. This is an intimate kind of knowing. This isn't just I, oh, I know your name is Dan. No, this is a very, a much deeper, intimate knowing. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. And that's what makes him the good shepherd <sighs> as opposed to the shepherd. Because he's He's there for their souls. He's there for the hearts of his sheep, as opposed to the regular shepherds of the time that were there. You know, it was their job. Mm -hmm. They were there. They were there to earn the money or to have their livelihood through the sheep, mm. not to know them intimately. But he's a different kind. Yeah, a mystery. <laughs> mm. There's so much in this parable and in this chapter. Is there anything else before we finish today that you really feel called to talk about or lift up? Um. There's a couple points that Sophia makes in the chapter about the Good Shepherd parable that I found very enriching on an adult level. I had never considered before the fact that why does he walk ahead of the sheep? Mm. And she points out to that is a total sign of trust. Yes. He's just trusting that the, she the sheep are going to follow him. Otherwise, he'd be walking behind them, prodding them forward, and that it's their choice. It's their free will to follow behind the shepherd. It really shows a really beautiful trust of the shepherd to the sheep that they're going to follow my voice. And if they don't want to, they might not follow me. Mm -hmm. They're going to walk somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It really shows that the free will that comes with the deep love that he has for us, that he loves us so much. He will give us that free will to follow or not follow. Honestly, when you were just talking about it though, it made me think about as catechists in the atrium, this is also what we are called to do there's free will involved in what the children are capable of in the atrium. I don't know. I think I have to sit and ponder that a little bit more to, to the, for the connection, but I just feel like there's a connection between um, the trust that the good shepherd has and the sheep that he's willing to walk in front of them and us trust and the children and the Holy Spirit's guiding the child in the atrium that we do not need to push them in a direction that they will follow the good shepherd as well, that we don't need to push. It takes so much trust and relinquishment doesn't it it's really like we're living in our indirect aims all the time yeah. <laughs> so we can't call forth uh directly yeah yeah um i really love the way sophia commented in verse nine verse nine is and we don't include this with the children but jesus said i am the gate mm. whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture and Sophia commented on that, that this coming in and going out signals complete liberty of movement. 
The sheep are not there to be circumscribed, limited, or imprisoned. They're there to find the greatest freedom of movement. It's again that trust and that relinquishment of control and that we are only in abundance of life when we have full freedom. Mm-hmm. So the the shepherd image of coming in and going out, it's it's our choice to come in and go out. It's like he's off to the side watching, guarding, enjoying our presence, but we have the freedom to come and go within this safe environment. And so we're we're happy. Mm-hmm. You know, with without that freedom we can't be truly happy. Mm-hmm. I would really appreciated that image that she gave us. And I have two others that I enjoyed very much. One is um, when Jesus said, this is later in the parable. We don't give this to the children. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. And in the book, which I hope the listeners will go back and read, Sophia asks, well, what does this mean, eternal life? And often we think of eternal life as something happening in eternity after death. Mm-hmm. But eternity is, knows no limit in time. Eternity is now. Eternity, according to Sophia, means that that's the abundance, the, the fullness of living in eternity, even now by starting to enter into this relationship of being known and following him. We have so much abundance in that relationship that we're starting to have this taste of eternity, even right now. That was really rich for me to contemplate and think about. Yeah, I really liked that too. And finally, just the fact that in this parable, that there is, again, like in the psalm, and also in Ezekiel's prophecy, this presence of good and evil. You know, in the psalm, we had walking through the dark valley. In Ezekiel's prophecy, we had the the poor shepherds were abandoning the sheep, and they were in a bad way. They were scattered and injured and lost and hungry. And in the parable... We have the thief comes in to steal, the hireling runs away when the wolf appears, and then Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Sophia calls that the very heart of the parable, and that's why we often talk about this at Paschal time, that this is a Paschal parable as well. It's it's suited to the Paschal mystery that Jesus brings this victory over death, over darkness, over the dark valley, over the um, abandoned sheep. He's giving us all that we need, but that we realize that in our life, as adults we know, and the older children know too, that we encounter the darkness and the the mystery of why are things like this? Why are why is there this suffering or this illness or someone encounters something that like, why does this happen to them? Well, we can't answer all that, but we can answer that we're called out of this darkness into this victory and abundance that Jesus gives us as the shepherd that's going to care for us. So that, that's an act of faith on our part, to relinquish ourselves to him. And I found that that presence of good and evil, I find it reassuring to encounter it over and over again in the face of mysteries of life that we can't explain. And especially if level three children, they start to encounter these as well and Mm -hmm. ask these questions that can't ultimately be answered, except perhaps by the imagery of a psalm, or perhaps by the imagery of a, a parable, that we don't have all the answers, but we have the example and the knowledge of what Jesus did to give us a certainty that we have to only rest in in faith. We can't explain it all. Mm -hmm. That was very rich for me as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There is so much in this chapter. Mm -hmm. We could, we could talk about it for a while. I I say that a lot on the podcast, but there is, it's just when you love this subject, it's really hard to, to limit yourself. Um, The very end or not the very, very end, but closer to the end of when she's talking about the good shepherd parable, she talks about, the difference between sacrifice and offering and the good shepherd's offering of himself. And I, I like that subject. I like that she lifts that up often in her writings because offering makes it a gift, you know, he, but he was not taken. It was offered. And there is such love when it comes to the difference between those two. Especially in John's gospel where he's always portraying Jesus as in charge mm. Like when he's arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, they come and say, who are you? He says, I'm Jesus of Nazareth. They all fall to the ground simply at that word. And I really enjoy the part of the parable Jesus said, this is offering theme. I have the power to lay my life down. 
and I have the power to take it up again. Like he has yeah. the power to be in charge here. He has the ability to offer it. And one of the very first times I worked with children in level two with the wolf and the hireling, we were, some of them came and laid down the good shepherd figure with the wolf coming to show that he had laid down his life for the sheep. And some of the other children said, well, then now what about the sheep? Mm hmm What's going to happen to them now because he's laid his life down? It was really good to turn to them, to that verse in the Good Shepherd parable where Jesus says, I have the power to lay my life down and the power to take it up mm. again. That was really reassuring to them to realize like, oh, he hasn't abandoned them. Mm -hmm. He's going to be there eternally. He's in full control. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. So much. Such a mystery, such a parable. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, Dan. I really appreciate you sitting with me and pondering this parable with me and this chapter with me and giving us the opportunity to reread it because it is such richness. I've enjoyed doing this with you, Carrie. <laughs> it's been a nice co-effort. Yes, thank you. it definitely has. Thank you. Thank you all for listening to this week's episode of the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. I hope that you enjoyed diving into chapter two of ways to nurture the relationship with God with Dan Teller and myself. In our show notes, I have a link to purchase the book Ways to Nurture the Relationship with God if you don't yet have one. Um, we ask that you please purchase it from our CGS USA store because it supports our work in CGS USA. I also am going to put some links to some different episodes that you might enjoy. So I'll put the links for chapter one and chapter three, which we have already completed from Ways. And then I'm also going to put links to two different episodes that have to do with the Good Shepherd. This coming Sunday is Good Shepherd Sunday, so we would love for you to have those as resources to prepare your hearts to celebrate Good Shepherd Sunday. So we have this chapter that we just did on Chapter 2 of with the Good Shepherd, but then there's also two other episodes. One is a reflection that Rebecca Reutsevich led for us a few years back on the Good Shepherd. Um, another one is a discussion about the Good Shepherd in the Eucharist. So please check out those episodes to help you dive into Good Shepherd Sunday. Don't forget that we have the audio version of The Religious Potential of the Child available. So if you want to know more about how to purchase access to the audio version of The Religious Potential of the Child, check out our show notes. This podcast is sponsored by the United States Association of the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. If you would like to know more about the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, or if you would like to support our work, become a member, and have access to all the member-only material that we have, please go to cgsusa.org. Thank you all for listening. We will see you in two weeks. Go and fall more deeply in love with God.